there, Dorian Daily listeners, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Dorian Daily Podcast. Today's quote comes from the late, great Winston Churchill, or as it is often attributed to the late, great Winston Churchill, and it reads, Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. I really like this quote, particularly insofar as you know, we're very privileged to to be in a in a Western democracy, yet at the same time we always c- complain about it, which of course we do have the the right to do as citizens. But at a certain point in time, it's probably good to to take a step back and reflect on on how lucky we are to to live in in such a political political system, given the other ones that we could have potentially lived in throughout throughout the course of history. And this quote is also directly related to the topic for today, uh, which is a discussion about William Lyon Mackenzie King, who, in my opinion, is one of, if not the greatest prime minister in, in the history of not just Canada, but in the, uh, the Commonwealth. This is uh, partly attributed to the fact that he was the longest serving prime minister, having served for well over 20, 20 years, which is longer than Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher or Stephen Harper, you, you name it. He's the longest serving prime minister. And I think it'd be a good topic to talk about how he really revolutionized the way politics at the federal level in Canada take shape, particularly insofar as the two governing parties at the federal level, the only two have been conservative and liberal. They they engage in what's called a brokerage style of politics. So they're really trying to appeal to the the centrist positions which makes up the vast majority of the the Canadian electorate and what you'll see what you'll see in the in the coming federal election which is scheduled to happen October uh, 21st or before as per the constitutional mandate the issues that the the liberals and conservatives debate are not like fundamental issues to Canada for instance they're not going to be like debating as to whether or not they should abolish the equalization payment system or the universal health health care system or any anything like substantive of that nature it's usually just like tertiary or like secondary issues that have to that have to be dealt with be it potential amendments to the immigration system or you know whether or not they're going to approve a, a pipeline which is obviously a big electoral issue for for people out west in the prairies, but not so much so for people in, you know, Ontario or Quebec, insofar as it won't affect their their gas prices going up, and to the extent that it would, maybe they it would become a much bigger issue. But again, the both parties they fundamentally agree on a, a lot of things, which is probably a good a good thing. Insofar as our political environment is not as polarized as as in some countries. It's. I usually am quoted as saying that the the liberals are really the conservatives in red, and the conservatives are really the liberals in in blue. And a, a good like way to substantiate this claim is that the the biggest federal budget decrease, presumably, you think conservatives are about you know fiscal conservatism. Conservatism is about saving money and saving tax tax dollars. But the the biggest drop in in federal budget. At, in the course of Canadian history, or at least in, in the past four or five decades, did not occur under a, a conservative, like under Mulroney in the 80s. It actually occurred under Jean Chrétien when he changed the equalization payment system. So for those that don't know, it, it's constitutionally mandated in Canada that all the provinces are to offer the the same amount or a comparable level of social services. So, you know, education and healthcare is not supposed to be substantially diff- different whether you live in in Halifax, Nova Scotia, or whether you live in Vancouver, British Columbia, or Toronto, Ontario. However, insofar as the, the social programs, um, particularly the two big ones being education and healthcare, they're provincial responsibilities and they're supposed to be um, provincial paid for by the provincial government. The reality of the situation is that the federal government has much higher taxation power in terms of uh, the Canada Revenue Agency and, and federal income tax. Is They take in more revenue per, per capita than do you know any given, given province. So 
by virtue of this fact and by virtue of the fact that the provincial governments do not generate enough income tax to, to pay for these programs, the the federal government has what's called equalization an equalization program whereby they essentially they do transfers to various provinces. You're either a have province or a have not province. And the have provinces essentially they they pay they don't receive money from the equalization program and the have not provinces like particularly like the Atlantic provinces, not the harp on the Atlantic provinces, but about a, a third of their, their provincial budget is actually just federal taxpayer money because they're they're paid for in the equalization program so that they can afford their their um, health and social programs. And this was uh, the change in in these types of equalization transfers and the kicking of the the budget for these two budgetary items much more to the provinces was uh, John Cretchen's idea. And that's what saved the the federal government at least huge amounts of expenditure in terms of uh, social spending. So that made him technically the most conservative prime minister in the last few few decades. And he wasn't even a conservative. He was a he was a liberal. <laughs> and before I I get into the William Lyon McKenzie thing, I think I should add about the equalization program. Maybe we'll do an episode to go a little bit further into it. But regardless of whether you live in a have or have not province, it, you're not paying more tax per capita. So everyone pays the same federal tax rate. Well, depending on what income bracket you're, you're in, there's no preferential treatment between what geographically what province you, you live in. You're paying like the same marginal tax rate based on your income. So I know it's particularly in Ontario, there's a lot of uh, political rhetoric from the provincial politicians that, oh, you know, we're paying for government budget deficits in Quebec or we're paying, you know, Ontario taxpayers are paying for people out east and subsidizing them through this equalization pro program. We should, you know, opt out of it. But the reality of the situation is that that's not the case. You're paying the exact same amount of tax given your marginal tax rate as anybody in any other province. And it's federal tax revenue. It's not provincial tax revenue. So this is like a classic political um, rhetoric that politicians use to, to drum up, you know, angst against the federal government. And there's there's plenty of angst to be thrown their way. Going back to the, the Winston Churchill quote that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other ones. But it's it's not actually a, a live a live issue, which just like one of the, the rhetorical issues that politicians use to, to drum up, you know, sort of contest contestation. But with that said, without any further ado, we'll get into today's topic, which is how Mackenzie King became the longest serving prime minister in any Westminster style system through adopting a brokerage style of politics, which is still prevalent in today's federal political landscape. So a little background about the longest serving prime minister in the history of Westminster style democracy. Uh, Mackenzie King was by far Canada's most educated prime minister. I uh, studied at a number of prestigious post-secondary institutions such as University of Toronto, Chicago, Harvard, and most impressively, the illustrious Osgoode Hall Law School. After having earned five degrees, including a, a doctorate and a, a Bachelor of Laws, uh, McKing emerged from school um, at the turn of the 20th century, well equipped to work in, in the public sector. And at the, the young age of 26, he was appointed to work in the federal bureaucracy as a deputy minister for the Labor Department, which is the highest non-elected position in, in the bureaucracy. And King continued to do so until 1908, when he was elected as a member of federal parliament. Once in parliament, King became the Minister of Labor under Wilfrid Laurier's liberal government and served until his seat was lost and the Liberal Party was defeated in the federal election by the Conservatives in 1911. Went out of, and for those who don't know, the, the only two parties that have formed government federally are the Conservatives and the, the Liberals. So after losing his seat in the 1911 election, King served as a consultant for the prominent American industrialist John D. Rockefeller Jr. It was not until 1919, so eight years later, that King would return to politics and win the first ever leadership convention for a Canadian political party. 
So after this, King would serve as the Liberal Party leader for 29 years from 1919 through till uh, 1948. So just after the 1418 war until about the end of, of World War II, of which he was Canada's uh, prime minister for a record 22 years from 1921 to 1926, 1926 to 1930, and 1935 to 1948. So he presided over um, Canada, Canada's federal political system throughout the entirety of the, the Second World War. Amidst uh, labor disputes, economic stagnation, war, volatile international markets, and turbulent trade, King was able to place his name among the most durable elected leaders in the democratic world. It's my hope through this discussion that we could shed some light on exactly why he was such an enduring figure in Canadian politics and generally pol electoral politics in general. Um, some argued that by virtue of the fact he was a liberal and liberals have been described as quote unquote Canada's natural governing party, given the, the political tendencies of the, the majority of our, our electorate, um, that this enabled him to stay in office amongst less politically adept competition. However, at this point in history, the Liberal Party only elected three prime ministers in comparison to the Conservative Party and their uh, historical affiliates who had elected nine prime ministers. These terms accounting for 20 years of office and 34 years, respectively. So at this point in time, you know, it wasn't clear that the Liberals were the quote unquote natural governing party. And it was found that, you know, King was really able to hold power as a result of his proficiencies in, in brokerage style politics, which enabled him to transcend regional uh, party class and group interests in order to accommodate Canada's diverse electorate and foster a sense of, of national unity, which is much easier said than done in Canada, being a, you know, a bilingual province, um, having Quebec and having very much a sense of, of regional identity, be it like if you're from the greater Toronto area or you're from rural Ontario or you're from the prairies or the West coast or, um, or you're a maritimer or you're a Quebecois or you're francophone. Again, there's much more regional identity indigenous or living up North. And it's, it's very difficult in, in Canada to, to appease to, to one homogenous group. You need to, uh, in order to succeed as a politician, you need to, to do what Mackenzie King did and, adopt like a, a brokerage style politics which is to fashion policies and legislation which is you know maybe not everyone's individual personal or ideal choice given their their region and their individual like regional identity but is is acceptable and is acceptable to the vast majority of the electorate which represents the the brokerage style big tent you know compromise which is inherent in the federal political system in today's day and age so contrary to leaders of political parties or ideological parties that represent distinct groups and articulate certain worldviews, brokerage leaders do not adopt uh, appeal to a single region, language group, religious community, or economic class over time. Under a brokerage style of politics, a clear party platform or agenda may be ambiguous even amidst the most partisan of political debates. The reason for this is, given the fact there is not one group or portion of the electorate represented, there exists exceptional demands on their leadership, which was a greater responsibility for who has a greater responsibility for aggregating, accommodating and articulating the interests of the electorate in order to formulate policy. As my favorite Mackenzie King quote reads, it's Canada has too much geography. What he meant by this is that the vastness of Canada's territory creates enormous differences in, in natural endowments and and political affiliations and this has resulted in a great number of diversities between the regions you know the regional differences and the conflict which arise of them is a key characteristic of canadian politics and it provides a strong incentive to adopt a brokerage style of politics to uh, accommodate these interests as the great canadian political scientist william cross put it in his book uh, political parties um, canadian parties need to represent represent and respond to all voters and not solely their activist base in order to be successful at the at the federal level in Canada. And this really dates back to the, the founding of Canada. Like evidently there was indigenous peoples who were here. And you can certainly argue that the the federal politicians have not brokered their interests interest well, and it's an ongoing, you know, issue in Canadian politics. 
but which is with respect to the the francophones and the british so when the french were living here predominantly settled along the saint lawrence the the major influx of of british persons was not until they lost the american revolutionary war and all the loyalists they came they came to the through the saint lawrence and essentially resided in or in a similar area to the francophone people that were living along the saint lawrence and they realized in classic, you know, like brokerage fashion, we need to devise a system where we can live together because you had all these, you know, French Catholics and pr- Protestant British people, and they had civil law, and we had um, British co- British common law, and they were not getting along. So they established Upper and Lower Canada and had two legislatures to deal with the regional matters, so property and, and education predominantly. And the, the federal legislature, like the Dominion of Canada, for, for more national governing issues. But that's another rabbit hole that maybe we can do a full uh, podcast on, on that. But for now, returning to, to Mackenzie King's style of politics. So the first interests that Mackenzie King sought to broker were not regional, but they were class-based. His job as the deputy minister and later minister of labor was to find compromise between two of the most divisive groups in Canada, not just in Canada, but the entire world, which is workers and employers, or the, the bourgeois and the proletariat, as, as some would say. Uh, so Mackenzie King was, was more than willing to tackle this, this issue, and he had a clear goal in helping bring about uh, changes in relations to labor and capital, as would secure a, a greater justice to, to the worker. Uh, prior to, to writing that sentiment in his, his diary, which Mackenzie King was a, a prolific uh, j- journaler, I guess you could say, um, he was already entrenched in Canadian labor law and was responsible for much of its uh, policy, sh- policy shape. King was very active in consolidating industrial disputes for the, the Trades and Labor Congress, independent workers and employers, such as uh, the Rockefellers. In typical brokerage fashion, King did not view his role as that of an agent of either capital or labor, so to speak, but believed in a tripartite negotiation between the the workers, the employers, and and the government. So the first major piece of legislation concerning labor, which King played an integral role in formulating, was the Industrial Disputes Investigation Act, the IDIA, of 1907. This legislation was brought about by an increasing number of uh, strikes at the turn of the century, and its passage quickly materialized after the infamous Lethbridge Miner Strike in Alberta in 1906. The strike was brought about by a great number of union issues and and grievances about wage and working conditions. Not only were people left without work in the small town, but the strike action led to violence. In the wake of the events, uh, Deputy Minister King at the time, he personally traveled um, to Lethbridge from Ottawa to mediate the dispute, Uh, something that maybe not many politicians would do these days. So King drew a number of conclusions from his involvement in the Lethbridge coal mine strike, One of them was that in any civilized community, quote, private rights should cease when they become public wrongs. And you can probably debate the the morality or the ethics of this claim, but, you know, putting that aside, while this may seem somewhat of a, you know, a radical pro-labor stance, it was a, a sentiment many Canadians, particularly those impoverished by labor disputes, shared with King to deal with future problems, um, King became the architect of the IDIA, the most, which is probably to this day the most significant Canadian legislation in industrial relations, which helped ensure strike action and conflict with employers would not turn violent. Um, it enforced mandatory, mandatory third-party conciliation between workers and employers and became a crucial element in regulating industrial conflict. Uh, his ability to mediate disputes between workers and employers caught the attention, um, as previously mentioned, of American industrialist John D. Rockefeller. So when King lost his uh, seat in the 1911 election, he was hired by Rockefeller to uh, be a consultant for his private company between the five years between 1914 and 1919. Uh, King's advice to Rockefeller was much along the same, you know, compromising and brokerage style policies, whereby he established within the company a board of both employees and and management um, in order to meet regularly and make their grievances known. You know, as in Canada, his tenure with the Rockefeller Company uh, made a lasting mark on American labor relations. After deciding to return to politics, King won the first ever leadership convention in Canadian history in 1921. Just three years removed from World War I, Canada was still 
very much divided by the conscript conscription crisis, which which was a prevalent federal political issue in the in the First World War, and people wondered if liberal supporters could stand by the new leader as loyally as they did the king's predecessor, Wilfrid Laurier, who was another prominent Canadian politician. Amongst the most regionally divisive issues in the education was that of tariffs, whereby every part of the country and every type of industry had a different stance on, on what goods to tax, quota, or regulate and trade, <laughs> much like the, the, the trade wars which are going on between you know, America and China right now. Tariffs are generally designed to reduce imports so that more domestic products are sold, providing quote unquote allegedly more employment in a country's economy. Economically, whether this is a, a true statement is is questionable and highly suspect. Insofar as when you reduce when you reduce import, generally speaking, the country that is exporting those goods has a comparative advantage in processing it. So you're saving the country while not producing it, you know, domestically. They're they're saving money. Um, domestically by, by by buying those goods from another country and the cost of living is essentially lower even though you may have not you may, you may have a few more jobs if you produce the good domestically but you can also the money you save can be put to a more efficient and more profitable use and all economics is, is just the allocation of scarce resources you know we have you know infinite wants and finite resources available and the hotly contested question becomes as you will see in the debates leading up to the election in october or how do we how do we allocate those scarce resources to their their best use but getting back to the 1921 election so many parts of the electorate mostly outside of central canada argued that only ontario and quebec are benefited by these protective tariffs and non-industrial workers often complain that it's only raising their, their cost of living, as we just alluded to. King's um, conservative opposition was Arthur Meehan, who, decis- who was decisively pro-tariff. Again, going back to liberals or conservatives in blue and conservatives or liberals in red, uh, generally speaking, you would think that being pro-tariff is not a conservative stance, but here you have a conservative politician saying that they are decisively pro-tariff. So Meehan stated, I stand for a protective tariff, and I've always done so. Again, not much of a conservative stance, but you can debate me on that. You know, King, on the other hand, as any true brokerage leader would have done, spent time aggregating, articulating, and accommodating the conflicting interests between those who wanted tariffs and those who did not want tariffs in the electorate. King insisted that the party ought to go about framing uh, for, of a tariff that will be fair to all sections of Canada and take into account the diverse conditions of the country. So given Meehan's hardline stance and King's tentative stance, one could assume that the outcome of the election could be moderately predetermined, whereby Meehan wins um, you know, Ontario and Quebec, the quote-unquote beneficiaries of the tariff, and King wins support from a scattered range of uh, non-central regions. However, despite being a net beneficiary of the tariff, Quebec Quebec voted overwhelmingly liberal, which propelled King to a slim majority over Meehan. It it could very well have been um, the detest of Arthur Meehan's conscription bill, as he was the sitting prime minister in the 1418 war, um, that outweighed the province's economic interests. But whatever the reason for the significant majority in Quebec, uh, King was a gracious benefactor. Um, as one liberal strategist would say, Quebec's shifting place in the key is the, really the key to understanding Canada's electoral politics. Uh, once, in, once in office, King's tariff policy could be described as slight at best. He, he made relatively minor changes in the tariff and in freight policy and managed to buy off some of the progressive leaders with, other, with, with offers of cabinet posts. So I think that's uh, interesting in and of itself that he offered conservative leaders positions in his cabinet which you know in today's the 21st century in today's day and age it's completely unheard of that you would offer somebody from another party a position in your cabinet but in true brokerage style fashion king actually offered conservatives positions in his his liberal cabinet which is after the prime minister cabinet ministers are the, the most powerful elected leaders in the country so the minimal tariff changes are, you know, symbolic of the fact that Mackenzie King was not trying to represent one particular interest group or one region in his first federal election. While many Ontario and Quebec liberal, liberals saw the tariff as a decisive 
electoral issue that called for a partisan yes or no, King was committed to brokering vast regional differences and was committed to formulating a policy that was acceptable to all regions of Canada, not just those where um, that were tariff proponents. A policy area in which King was by no means as hesitant to take a stance on was social welfare. Uh, under King's, King's lead, the Liberals would adopt a program that included support for the living wage, the eight-hour workday, unemployment insurance, old age pensions, and mother's allowances. So he really presided over the, the start of the, the social welfare state in Canada. And once once you give those goodies out, it's very difficult to take them away from the electorate. As we can see, the the social spending, if you look at any any graph, social spending since the 1920s, you know, per capita has ballooned and is jettisoned and it keeps going up and up and up. Whether this is a good or bad thing can be d debated depending on your political ideology, but just for our purposes, it's just interesting to know that King was a huge proponent of the early social welfare state, which is aimed at satisfying, you know, a broad majority of the electorate in the forms of a, like the working class, be it like mid the middle class or the, the lower, in lower income class, the, which represent, you know, the vast majority of Canada is middle class which is you know a good thing on, on our part we're not as you know it, there's not as much income inequality as some countries like in, in mexico or brazil so to appease like the vast majority of the electorate to to offer them things such as this was very you know reassur reassuring uh, some would trace the advocacy of these policies back to king's days as a labor minister whereby he was dedicated to improving the lot of uh, working people across the country um, others saw the implementation of these policies as a political move, which sought to undermine the Co Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which um, was the early the early NDP. So by implementing a number of social welfare policies that the CCF, which is now the NDP, were already in favor of adopting, he sort of like took the rug out from underneath them. So irrespective, again, classic brokerage, you have the CCF or the NDP, which are left center and you got the conservatives which are quote right center and he's taking a, a centrist position so irrespective of the the origin of these policies their nature was well intentioned furthermore the social welfare policies king introduced were were clearly not beholden to one's one group's interests be they you know mothers workers seniors and unemployed people they all benefited from these policies so before i go on to discuss a, a few more maybe i'll i'll just venture briefly into the the infamous King Bing affair. It's one of those things that if you went to high school in Canada, you probably learned about and long since for forgotten, or maybe you have remembered it. It's somewhat of a epic constitutional crisis. And insofar as uh, King is our subject point today, it would not serve him justice to not to not bring it up because it was a somewhat defining moment in Canadian history. So, as you may know, Canada is a is a constitutional monarchy. And if you've ever seen that that Rick Mercer sketch where he, he asks Canadians who the head of head of state is, because everyone you know think it's the prime minister, but the the actual answer is it's the Queen of England, <laughs> which is kind of it's funny. But anyway, um, the monarch currently is Queen Elizabeth II, who embodies the authority of the Canadian state, and any action of government that Canada takes, it's in her her name. And the monarch is responsible for appointing the, the prime minister and for deciding when parliament will be dissolved and a new election held. When she is not in Canada, which because Queen Elizabeth II is old as hell, so most of the time, I can't even remember when the last time she was here, um, her duties are carried out by the, the governor general. Although the, the strict letter of the constitution suggests that the role of the monarch in Canada's system of government is a formidable one, most Canadians realize that the Queen and the Governor General perform mainly symbolic functions, and the real decision-making powers of the executive are exercised by the Prime Minister, who is the head of government and cabinet. So this unwritten constitutional convention that the Governor General generally adheres to the advice of the Prime Minister and the legislature was put to the test in the, the King Bing affair. So in the 1925 election, the conservative Arthur Meehan's conservatives they actually beat um, William, William Lyon Mackenzie King's liberals. They, they captured 115 seats in the House and the liberals only captured 100. But the, the third highest number of seats were captured by the Progressive Party, they, by Robert Fork was the leader, and they captured 22 seats. And it was, it was somewhat clear 
like in the next in the le- in the legislature once they all convene that the conservative party under Arthur Meehan, even though they had the most seats at 115, they weren't going to be able to uh, elect a prime minister or elect Meehan as the prime minister because the Liberal Party and the Progressive Party they agreed to form an alliance and collectively with their 122 seats, it looked like they were going to elect Mackenzie King as the as the prime minister. However, the agreement between the, the Liberal Party and the Progressive, it, it collapsed. So King never got appointed um, prime minister after the 1925 election. And he, he's actually asked Governor General Baron Bing to to dissolve parliament and, and hold another election because it was unclear that the conservative would be able to form to elect me in as the prime minister. But when King asked governor general Bing to do this, he was like, nah, well, let's give me a, a chance, even though the, the popular vote was, was against him and it would have been very difficult. And it did prove very difficult for him to form government and pass legislation. And, you know, after much hurrah and Mackenzie King, you know, campaigning and going to the press about how how terrible the governor general is for not letting them do this and how terrible the federal political situation is insofar as they're not getting any bills passed. Eventually, after a vote of non-confidence, which said that Meehan wasn't, you know, able to, to serve his mandate and fulfill the prime ministerial role, they did have another election the very next year, so in the fall of 1926, and in that election, Mackenzie King won and formed government again. So, long story short, through the King Bing affair, Mackenzie King was uh, effectively solidifying the role of the Prime Minister and the unwritten convention that the Governor General would is supposed to adhere to the Prime Minister's advice. Even though he wasn't technically prime minister at the time, he was supposed to adhere to the advice of the legislature when they had had support for a dissolution of parliament, and he refused. And this this event really um, it sharpened not only Canada's democratic institutions, but all of the former British colonies because it was one of the key talking points in the uh, the passing of the 1931 Statute of Westminster, which really gave the former British colonies uh, sovereignty over the the, the monarch. And, and entrenched the sovereignty over the monarch and allowed their own federal political institutions such as the the legislature to to make to make legislative decisions on their own behalf and to dissolve parliament and form government when they choose within the appropriate time frame and not have it blocked by a, a non-elected official that's supposed to be representing the the queen or the monarch so coming out of that rabbit hole and going back to brokerage politics, we have Mackenzie King offering, you know, living wage, unemployment insurance, mother's allowances, the eight hour day, also giving women the, the right to vote. All policies that were not necessarily like, politically dangerous at the, at the time, they met with like political fanfare from large segments of the Canadian population. Other policies that he was... Um, made to adopt were, were much more controversial. One example was during the Great Depression, during the, the 1930s, King had to, to broker um, support for a, a new like macroeconomic theory in, in Keynesian economics and instill it into the, the federal budget, particularly the, the 1936 Canadian federal budget. So given, given King's extensive, extensive knowledge of... Uh, economics and his you know great education he understood the importance of of balanced budgets the role of markets and the need for for rational government spending and to not carry like extensive budget deficits again this coming from a, a liberal prime minister but very much a, a fiscally conservative at the at the time but the the great depression you know it, it hit the economy especially the canadian economy so hard that things needed to change and part part of that change um, was was fostered by by John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, and his um, Keynesian or Keynesianism school of macroeconomic theory. So essentially, for those who don't know, like basically Keynesianism is um, in direct contrast to like a liberal school, like a small L liberal. So like Frederick Frederick Hayek just wants like small government spending, no budget deficits, and for the the market to to work its magic. <laughs> 
in very simple terms, but uh, Cain, John Maynard Keynes and Keynesianism essentially said that there is a role for government to play in the economy, whereby they actually spend money um, during recessionary periods in the economy or in this event during like a depression to quote unquote prime the pump and stimulate economic activity. So even if this means running budget deficits, and there's a long-standing debate amongst economists as to whether or not the Keynesian spending actually works, whether it would help revert the economy out of a recessionary period faster than a small liberal approach or like a laissez-faire approach whereby the government doesn't uh, put any stimulus packages into the economy. But regardless of whether what side of the debate you stand on that, maybe we'll do a, a podcast later on. The reality of the situation is that the, the 1936 budget was the first time in Canada that the government adopted a, a Keynesian approach. And really, John Maynard Keynes wanted the the government spending to stop once the recessionary period was over. But as, as you see in the 21st century, budget deficits from governments are just perennial things. I think the previous fiscal year, the federal government ran a budget deficit of $19 billion. And that was during a time of it was, we're in the middle of a, a long bull market of economic prosperity, not recession. So it's, it's interesting that it's really become government spending has become decoupled from the business cycle. So it doesn't matter whether in your, you're in a recession, a boom or a bust period. There, there's pretty well consistent government spending relative to GDP and they just keep it like that. And we can debate the merits of that approach at some other time. But for now, for our purposes, it's just interesting to say that you know, King's willingness to to aggregate and articulate different interests within Canada and at the time of the Great Depression to adopt a, a new economic policy that was never a liberal policy and a liberal party policy and never one that's been used in Canada before, you know, shows that he's willing to compromise his own economic doctrines of, you know, strict government spending, you know, for the sake of fostering consensus and great mutiny through, through a brokerage style of governance. So I think that's that's good for examples, and it's he's personally a, a hero of mine that you can see from his early days as a bureaucrat to his latter years in, in power as Canada's longest serving prime minister. He was a, a man of compromise and negotiation, whether it be mediating industrial disputes between workers and employers, formulating a tariff policy to accommodate Canada's diverse regional interests, or adopting an economic policy that runs counter to his very own education from the free market Chicago school. Um, King's politics was distinctively non-beholden to any formal group or specific ideology. And it was through this style of politics that Mackenzie King was able to broker compromise between different regions, classes, and ideologies, and really stay in power for, for longer than any prime minister in a Westminster system. So while many party leaders since King have tried to emulate his his ability and his political prowess, indeed the the Liberals remain adamant about maintaining title of Canada's natural governing party, you'd be hard pressed to to find another leader that can find compromise and accommodate Canada's vast array of interests as well as Mackenzie King did. So I think that's that's it for now. I guess one more thing before I sign off is I strongly encourage everyone to vote in the upcoming federal election taking place in October and do a little bit of research as to which which of the candidates you prefer. I, I'm usually quoted as saying the federal election is the time every four years where we we kick this group of incompetents out and replace them with a new group of incompetents. And I say that endearingly. It's an extremely difficult job and one that it's extremely, you know, noble of the individuals running for, for parliament to take on in so far as it's they could probably be getting higher pay in the in the non public service in the private private business realm. So it's a it's I truly, you know, appreciate the the role that they take on and trying their best to to govern the country. And I think for us individually you have, you know, three good reasons to to vote. The first being that you, you, you lose your right to complain about what the government's doing if you didn't participate in the election because you had the opportunity to, to have a, to put a different government in power and you chose not to do that. The second being that we should be tremendously proud and thrilled out of our skulls to live in a Westminster style democracy. And going back to, to Winston Churchill's quote, it's the, 
the worst form of government except for all the others. And it, we're extremely fortunate to be able to have a say in who our leaders are and what how our country w- is going to take shape. Many people throughout the course of history and even around the world today, do they, they do not have that, that power. So I think that it's, it's tremendous responsibility and, you know, it's one that shouldn't be taken lightly. And the third reason is Mackenzie King would want you to. And for that, I think I'm going to, to leave it there. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great evening.